Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of The Pod Is Cast. Uh, this time, we're going to be taking a look at... Uh, it's really the Battle of the Chosin Reservoir, although to explain that battle, I have to give some backstory uh, with the Korean War. Um, so, Adrian, why don't you just go ahead and... What do you know so far about the Chosin Reservoir? No, Not too many spoilers. But... All right, uh, I'll give... Uh, I'll give the basic overview, right, right. and hopefully I don't get too much wrong. So it was pretty much um, <clears throat> it was pretty much uh, with the Marines got kind of got kind of cut off by a uh, you know overwhelming uh, North Korean and Chinese uh, force in like a big valley or a, like valley and like reservoir in uh, and in, in in the middle of the winter. Always fun. Yeah. Yeah, so so this is gearing up to be a, be an exciting one. <laughs> right. Yeah, that was, that was pretty good. Uh, for the most part, completely right. Um, so the Korean War starts on June 25th, 1950, when... Oh my god, I hate the names of communist countries because they're so ridiculous. When the Democratic People's Republic of Korea and the... Uh, Korean People's Army invaded South Korea. Funnily enough, uh, the, the, the Republic's not very democratic, <laughs> and the army was not, not really the people's. <laughs> yeah, not in the interest of the people. So, in World War II, when the Japanese surrendered, there's, an, there's really a debate over what prompted them to surrender more, whether it was the atomic bombs what I believe, or the entry of Russia into the war. What Russia did was they entered at the very end at the request of Truman and Churchill to end the war sooner, and they just did a land grab. As much land as they could possibly get from Japan. And Japan had owned Korea since I believe it was about 1913 they first colonized it, when their imperial ambitions really came to fruition. Um, So the Russians... And the Americans both accepted surrenders of Japanese garrisons. And eventually, a line got drawn in the 38th parallel. Because, you know, who needs to pay any respect to topography or ethnic or family lines? Zip! Yeah, straight just, line. We'll just draw a straight line on the 38th parallel. Best best way to make borders. I mean, it's, it's like Sykes-Picot. I mean, seriously, these people just draw straight lines on maps and think that that's good. Anyway, uh, that's 1945. Uh, Syngman Rhee is elected. Uh, you debate over whether that was a true election or not. A, an American puppet. He gets put into office for the South Koreans, head of the actual republic of the two and Kim Il-sung is put in charge of the north a real real cool guy as <laughs> recognized by history right and so are his his son and grandson also uh-huh. class acts yeah um so by 1949 it's pretty clear that Mao's going to win the Chinese civil war and so the US stops funding Chiang Kai-shek everyone evacuates to Taiwan and we're kind of focused on a couple things. Um, the Russians are pretty close to, if not already developed, a nuclear bomb. It'll be showcased to the world shortly and really freak everyone out. And Chinese imperial ambitions in the Far East. Because Mao Zedong may... There, there were plans drawn up to invade uh, Taiwan to get rid of the last remnants of Chiang Kai-shek's... Um, pro-Western government, I strain to call it a democracy. Okay, it's choose your dictator slash warlord. Anywho, so Kim Il-sung is kind of... He's asked by Stalin. He's voluntold to invade (laughs) South Korea. I mean, obviously he's not, like, opposed to it. He thinks his army can handle it. And North Koreans and South Koreans have been fighting border incursions... Uh, since after World War II ended. So Stalin wants to see how far he can push the West on this. So he kind of suggests Mm -hmm. that he invade South Korea. And, of course, he he doesn't really have an option here. What's the the joke with Stalin, right? It's like 
uh, these people come and visit him, and eight of them, they're eight visitors, and when they leave, Stalin realizes that he lost his cigarette. So he says, he thinks one of them stole it. And so the next day, he's rifling around his drawers, and he finds it, and calls up the head of security and says, no, no, I, I got it, I didn't lose it. And they go, oh, that's too bad. Uh, four of them confessed, and the other four died in interrogation. <laughs> So that's, you know, that's really what you're dealing with, right? You've, when, when Stalin tells you or asks you to do something, you're going to do it. So the U.S. had an advisory group there called KMAG. We had KMAG there, and we also had uh, the occupation forces in Japan. Those were our two closest troops when war breaks out. Now, a couple of KMAG advisors really trained their units because they were sure that North Korea was about to invade. All the signs were there. Buildup of tanks, concentration of troops, um, evacuations from frontline cities, all the telltale signs. And so on June 25th, 1950, after Mao's, Mao and Stalin really, they wanted him to do it more so during the campaigning season, uh, but he's so, he's so confident of victory. He being Kim Il-sung is so confident of victory, they go in September, or they go in June. Uh, kind of towards the tail end of campaigning season. It's, it's what, I mean, June is when Hitler invaded Russia. So it's a gamble. If you're moving fast, yeah. you'll be okay if you invade in June. But I think von Clausewitz would agree with me here. You, you want to go April <laughs> so that you can make full use of spring and summer. That's, that'll buy you plenty of time. Uh, so he invades, and South Koreans are wholly unprepared there's a couple of really brave last stands by South Korean soldiers, mostly artillerymen, to try and at least just slow the advance. Because the South Koreans, uh, they didn't have any tanks. The North Koreans were a Russian-style army. So that means tons of heavy artillery. We're talking 105, 150 millimeter, 155 millimeter. Um, tons of T-34s, thousands of them. Uh, and then hundreds of thousands of troops to attack in mass formations. So they shell your position, and while they're shelling, the tanks followed by our infantry come up, and the shelling stops, and they're right on top of you. The South Koreans had surplus World War II cannons and artillery. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, not the, not the greatest thing to be up against. Yeah, I mean, you, you even look at their uniforms back then, it's... it's clothes it's just whatever they have yeah it's not yeah you know, you'd be hard pressed to find south korean soldiers really truly uh, equipped with anything other than leftover japanese rifles and their clothes <laughs> their own just civilian clothing yeah up against a trained well-armed by their standards north korean army and kind of well-armed by most standards yeah they were actually not terribly uh, unequipped Unlike most communist armies, it was maybe one one every other four people. One out of every other four people didn't have a rifle rather than every other person. It's not bad. <laughs> For a communist country, that's, that's pretty good. Pretty good. <laughs> All right. So uh, the U.S. and the U.N. freak out, of course, and decide on sending uh, uh, Stalin basically argues in the UN, oh, don't don't get involved, it's not our business, but it pretty clearly is, because North yeah. Korea is, as we know now, incredibly oppressive. Uh, so the UN starts sending forces, mostly by the US, I believe. The US had like 300,000 troops, and the next closest was England, with like 15, 20,000 troops, mm -hmm. so a little bit of a difference there. There's also Canadians, Australia, all the Commonwealth soldiers... Uh, India provided medical assistance, Turks fought, I think Norwegians fought, I know the Belgians did, the French did. So you've got the whole, it's the it's the first true quote-unquote police action of the United Nations. Uh, the North Koreans move fast, kind of blitzkrieg, Russian, well, the speed of the blitzkrieg mixed with the, World like, War II Russian tactics. Yeah, the kind of... Just sheer manpower and firepower. Yeah. Right, right. Because the whole... They didn't really... They had rifles and such, but they were... The the base of the army is that you close it in so close that it turns into hand-to-hand -hand fighting with submachine guns, grenades, knives, and clubs that just by sheer manpower alone... You just kind of roll over the enemy. Right, you'll steamroll them. 
This is why I mean, this is why the Russian army is during World War Two is considered a steamroller because that's just what they did. I, I mean, yeah, yeah, it's just ridiculous, absolutely ridiculous, especially against the kind of unsuspecting, ill-equipped yeah. army like the South Koreans. Yeah, exactly. So the U.S. sends this group uh, called Task Force Smith to try and slow down the North Korean advance until more troops can get there. And it's made up of occupation troops, mostly from the 24th Infantry and I want to say like 7th Infantry too. They're, but they're occupation forces. So they're, they join the war effort either at the tail end of World War II or they missed it entirely. And they've been sent to walk around Tokyo and Osaka and make sure nothing happens. <laughs> They're, they've the easiest job in the world. Douglas MacArthur's overall commander in the region. He kind of takes action and sends this task force there. And the idea, as ill, ill-advised to do, is just completely underwhelming or underestimating the North Korean army, not only in strength, but in morale. And the idea, the common thought is, well, once they see our, like, white faces and American uniforms, they'll turn around and surrender. Turns out when you send a small, unprepared force to supplement (laughs) a small, unprepared force, it's not that scary. (laughs) Yeah, so the North Koreans are like, great, now we get to kill the people we really hate, capitalist Americans. Awesome. And not only that, capitalist Americans with little to no artillery, maybe a mortar battalion or two, and just, I mean, you've got your standard rifles, carbines, they're not there, they're not prepared for the fight that they're in. And they end up fighting for their lives with most of them dying, because it's, they're completely over, they don't even, the bazookas they have are like three inch bazookas, they won't do anything, they barely did anything against old tanks of World War II, they're sure not going to do anything against yeah. Russian T-34 85s. They had to invent a new bazooka because of Task Force Smith. And I'm calling it the Super Bazooka. It's uh, like 3.5 inches and it's way more powerful rocket. <laughs> but either way, they didn't have those yet. And so these guys get completely pushed back and almost wiped out. And But the U.S. is able to throw enough forces in to build up and protect... Uh, the port of Pusan, and it becomes the Pusan perimeter, where they hold off uh, until September of 1950. So it's June, July, August. There's almost four months Mm -hmm. of holding out. Like, more like three. Is this the point to where it's kind of like outposts and, like, uh, kind of sporadic fighting on the perimeter until... Uh, Outposts, not as well, because more trench. Think, Think, like... I'm trying to think of a good equivalent from World War II. Uh, think Tobruk. Mm, yeah. Okay, so it's like a fort, pretty much. Mm-hmm. It's it's heavy defending of a perimeter, because outpost is, like, too spread out, yeah. maybe. And it's not really sporadic. It's pretty constant fighting. And it's the first time that our troops had to deal with anything like this, because even if they were battle-hardened veterans of World War II, either in the European theater or Pacific theater, the most they had to deal with was bonsai charges, And Banzai wasn't protected by artillery or followed up by tanks. And those guys weren't armed with machine guns. They had bayonets and swords. Yeah. Right. You know, (laughs) to this point, we're kind of, we're we're used to being on the same side as the the Russians or, you know, (laughs) technically not the Russians. The the North (laughs) Koreans, wink. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And all the same time, the only thing that really kept the North Koreans from doing anything was the fact that we had total air supremacy. And we were flying outdated jets. You're talking like, uh, was it P-80 shooting stars or F-80 shooting stars? Uh, F-82, the twin Mustang. Mm. <laughs> Those were great ground attack. The Navy's flying Corsairs and like F-9F uh, cats. I don't remember what they're. Are they wild? No, they're not wild cats. Um, Bearcat. Hold on. Regardless, okay, doesn't matter. They're flying lightly armed uh, ground attack planes that are slow and not really maneuverable, but it doesn't matter yet because we have complete and total air superiority, and we're able to hold off the Koreans 
the North Koreans long enough uh, to not only start evacuating civilians, but to allow MacArthur, before he goes completely ape crazy, um, to do... This is only when he was halfway (laughs) ape crazy. (laughs) Yeah, this is... This is post World War II, right before let's nuke China kind of crazy yeah. MacArthur. That, that's later to come, you know. Yeah, we're we're right on the border from good crazy to bad crazy. Right, and so he and his military planners draw up what is, in my opinion, one of the greatest uh, military landings and maneuvers in military history. It's absolutely genius. And what you do is you go behind enemy lines. They go... So if you look at the peninsula of Korea, uh, you've got Pusan is in the bottom uh, eastern corner. It's literally on the edge of the country. It's, It's a coast. Okay, it's a port. Incheon and Seoul are at the border of the 38th parallel on the far, uh, kind of like mid part of the peninsula on the west coast. Yeah, so it's like pretty much... In the sand, it's like, there's like the, the sea that goes there, and so mm-hmm. it's like Korea, Korean coast, ocean, China. Yeah, so it's like they've, you know, once they've been pushed back to the Pusan perimeter, the North Koreans are concentrated on fighting along the perimeter... And they're, they're and all they're, their forces are there. Yeah. They completely neglect uh, Incheon. They have forces They've got in the Seoul. entire force uh, kind of guarding Seoul and then the perimeter. And then MacArthur kind of pushes into this little... It's like a bay or something, isn't it? Yeah, so Incheon is also a big port, and it's got these huge uh, walls. Or at least big sea walls, yeah. Yeah, big, big sea walls because the tides are so crazy there. Uh mm. MacArthur lands the troops at like the the perfect tide. Yeah, in the, the middle troops, of the night, they sail the, in in the middle of the night. The troops get in and you know unload without incident. And you know what it was? Like, it was the first time that seals really got put to use. Yeah. Oh, that's right. They yeah, had a they bunch had of UDT uh, underwater divers. demolition teams. Yeah, that was awesome. That, that's that, so uh, cool. that built that cleared out the. Yeah, it was actually cleared out the. It was like one guy doing most of the work. Yeah, it was a small group of. Uh, Precursors. Really highly trained uh, precursors to the Navy SEALs. Yeah, like it's really highly trained UDT uh, frog kind of yeah, that's what they're uh, demolition crews that went in and cleared out the um, the bay, yeah, the, bay the whole bay out of mines. and it allowed it allowed them to sail in there, you know, uh, and kind of get everybody landed without much incident at all. Yeah, it was is awesome maneuver, and yeah. as soon as, and the city of Incheon itself is taken. Almost immediately. There's only like a tiny, tiny garrison there, isn't there? Yeah, and most of them had already been neutralized. Like yeah. they just, they were either gone or they didn't really care. Uh, didn't and... they kind of like bomb Inchon a little bit? Yeah, it, to... it wasn't It wasn't heavy. It was a, it was a yeah. strategy from Normandy where you bomb the whole area because you don't want to give away the actual landing exactly. site. So, but they, they landed there and it was mostly Marines. It was Ned Allman's 10th Corps, I believe. Um, yeah, didn't they put together 10 Corps? For the yeah, invasion for, of Inchon. for Operation Chromite is what it's called. So Ned Almond is called Ned the Dread. Uh, he's this very he's a prodigy of MacArthur, and he loves MacArthur. And he's not a terrible general. In fact, in World War II, he's actually pretty competent. But he's very much the like George Custer rah rah movie kind of general. Mm-hmm. Complete disregard. For safety, really reckless, actually. Um, and versus the commander of the 1st Marine Division, which is attached to Tin Corps, and that is uh, General Oliver Smith, who's cautious, really cares about his men, will fight with superiors to make sure that his men don't get killed, uh, mostly loses on that one, really hates Ned Almond. They do not like each other at all. Um, Ned, Ned the Dread, and Oliver Smith, great guy, fantastic general, tactically and just on a human level, just a good all around person. He in fact is very pro. Ned Almond was pretty blatantly racist. In fact, I think he commanded uh, 
an all black infantry division during World War II. That'd be the 93rd, 92nd. It's the. I think it's either 92nd or 3rd. I think it's 93rd. 92nd are the Buffalo Soldiers, right? That's their SSI. Yeah. Or is it yeah, 90, yeah. 93rd is the Adrian Helmet? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah right, so right. he commands. He commands the 93rd in Europe, and uh, <laughs> he's completely disappointed and just com- always complains about the quality of his soldiers and how bad African Americans are. And Oliver Smith is the complete opposite, where he's completely pro integration, um, doesn't very pro equality, especially for the Marine Corps. He doesn't yeah. think that your skin color should determine your fighting ability and that everyone has the right to wear the uniform. Respectful great guy. Yeah, yeah, great guy. So we know only great <laughs> things are going to happen to him and his yeah. troops. Oh, my God. So they, they get in and they start to push. The 10th Corps starts to push to Seoul, and they're going to try and cut off the North Korean army and trap them behind the 38th parallel. And at the same time, the Pusan perimeter, now that all the North Korean troops are either in headlong retreat or pushing to Seoul... Uh, the Pusan perimeter explodes pretty much, and everyone just, all the troops from around the globe uh, can almost immediately push the North Koreans back. That's in September. I'll have to get the exact date here for when the landing in China is. That'd be September 15th uh, to the 19th. And then September, October, Seoul had cleared out. Seoul was difficult because that was actual, you know, the Battle of Mosul. You look at the Battle of Berlin, it's that kind of street fighting. Yeah. Dirty, nasty, kicking indoors, dealing with snipers, uh, berms everywhere. It's horrible. Yeah. Absolutely terrible. And even when MacArthur declared the city free, it really wasn't. Mm. He did that whole BS cockamamie flag ceremony for Syngman Rhee where he's like, your country is now yours again. Except that they're still in the middle and actually kind of beginning stages of the war. Yeah, and there was like artillery flying. The building they were in, the roof was shelled completely. <laughs> it's just, just a horrible situation. So they push out of there. And, and then he transitioned <laughs> to the bad crazy. Yeah, this is where we lose MacArthur. This is where MacArthur starts to go absolutely nuts. And this is the point where he starts advocating. Uh, actually, it's a little later. But at this point, he's crazy... No, he's not nuke crazy yet, but he really... We're, we're getting up there. Yeah, we're getting there. We're, uh... So the the UN is saying, oh, only push up to the 38th parallel, and MacArthur's saying, nope, we're pushing him to the Yalu, which is the river that borders the Korean peninsula with China. <laughs> he's psycho. He's so psycho. And uh, if, if you know anything about the, uh, the division of uh, North and South Korea today... Didn't didn't quite work out. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they start pushing back, and uh, we parachute into Pyongyang. Uh, our troops are just flying across the border. Eighth, the 8th Army... Uh, no, the 8th Army landed at Incheon, too. Mm. We've got, like, yeah. the 7th Cavalry and stuff. I mean, these guys are just flying into the Yalu. Mao starts getting on the airways and saying, uh, if... U.S. troops continue to the Yalu River, China will intervene. They, in fact, when the Chinese completely intervene, blatantly, uh, they leave, they go around South Korean units. And they just attack ours. <laughs> but they, they're saying, like, we will, of course this is BS because Mao is going to get involved Regardless, yeah, that's um, it's kind of so. I, I actually agree with MacArthur on this one for calling Mao's bluff and continuing to push. I respect. I mean, the North Korean government was gone; they were in hiding in China, and I mean, Mao Mao started sending volunteer units. Yeah, before before China's intervention, it was actually looking pretty good for us. Yeah, it was. It was one of the few wars where it was we will actually be home by Christmas. Yeah. Of course they weren't, but the idea was that, I mean, it was, it was really going that smoothly. Yeah, it was, it went once after, after Inchon, it was kind of a, of course until China got involved, it was kind of a clear shot. Yeah, and the Chinese did the thing that 
communist countries love to do, which is you send volunteers. And it's not, you know, exclusive to We use that term volunteer <laughs> very loosely, yeah. as I'm sure you also know with communist countries. It's take any flag patches off. You guys, as far as they care, you guys are either volunteers or you're Korean citizens. So... <laughs> They, they started pouring in, and of course our guys captured them and would send reports to Tokyo, where MacArthur was based out of, that, hey, look, Chinese soldiers are here. They're, they're saying that entire divisions are massed on the border with Manchuria. They're about to come. They're about to attack us. And MacArthur, of course, says, nah, you're full of it. Keep pushing. They're Korean. The, the bad crazy leader <laughs> keeps, on, keeps on ticking. If it's a Geiger counter, he's, he's like pretty radioactive <laughs> the, the, the the dial has just snapped off right it's it's bad ned allman's the same way i don't know if he honestly knew that the, i think he was crazy just as crazy as macarthur uh oliver smith is saying seriously this is bad they're really here again to which macarthur and allman say nah they're not yeah these are volunteers <laughs> like i'm just gonna never tell the truth on that kind of thing uh, and as the the army nears the Yalu River, we actually make it there. We stop at the Yalu, and I believe MacArthur pees in it. Cool guy. Because I know Patton peed in the Rhine, and, <laughs> and I think MacArthur pees into the Yalu River. Uh, a class act. <laughs> really classy. Because, you know, that that won't anger China anymore, right? They'll, they just, they'll take it like, in stride. It's like when, you're, when your sibling tells you to get out of their room, so you stand, like, right on the doorway. <laughs> yeah, I'm not in your room. Uh-huh. Uh, and at the same time, the Marines from the 1st Marine Division, it's actually, it is Tin Corps. Tin Corps is in the Chosin Reservoir, which is high up in the mountains of North Korea, kind of towards the center uh, and they're just supposed to be guarding there against any attacks. Well, Chinese troops have already completely filtered in. Uh, God, it's such a mess. It's and such this a mess. is when the this is when, when the poop hits the fan. The, the doo doo hits <laughs> the fan. So our troops, our Marines, are on this frozen river. It's a da- or dammed up lake, so it's a reservoir. Uh, the Chinese dammed, or the Japanese dammed it up in the 30s and 40s. And it's so cold that the entire thing is just frozen over. And there's Arctic, Arctic weather coming in from Siberia that drops the, the weather to... Sometimes it can get as low as negative 35 degrees Fahrenheit with a wind chill of negative 70. Man... I mean, I don't even think freezers get that cold. Yeah, being from Texas, even positive 70 is getting a little chilly. Yeah, my gosh. So they're oh my, negative 70. It's ridiculous. And they're they're equipped for the winter. As far as, as you can be as, for yeah, negative as, 70. As far as you can be for that kind of cold. And with the intention that they'll just be guarding the cities of uh, Hagaruri and Udamni. Not really. They're not expecting any push. The war's over. We won. Psych. Yeah. On the night of, this is November now, November 27th, 1950, the Marines are dug in. Oliver Smith, luckily for his men, is very cautious. So he orders them to dig in no matter what and to prepare for attack because he thinks one is coming, but he obviously can't prove anything. Of course, an attack does happen. And thousands and thousands of Chinese soldiers attack him from the 9th Army Group under General Song. Now, they had been originally intended to be outfitted for the winter and then sent into Korea covertly uh, a little later. So they would have been filtering into Korea with winter clothing by the time that they actually are there and invade. So Mao speeds that up, says, you know, like, they don't need winter clothing. They'll be okay. (laughs) Uh, Some of these guys don't have shoes. Actually, a lot of them don't have shoes. They're lightly equipped for winter. The shoes that they do have are canvas shoes, kind of like (laughs) all-stars. Horrible. Very few of them have rifles. That's that's spread out. That's maybe like one every four has a rifle. And most of them aren't even rifles. They're they're burp guns, PPSH-41s. 
Some of them have spears, sharpened bamboo sticks, knives glued into bamboo sticks, grenade. Ah. They don't even have artillery. They're rushed so fast that they don't have any artillery. And even if they did, they couldn't use it because our air power, our planes would be sh- destroying them. So they have to move at night. It's a huge mess. And they, the one thing that they really believe in is that U.S. forces are unprepared for night fighting. And we are. That's a fair criticism. We've That's always been our as, weakness. As unprepared as we might have been for night fighting, at least we had guns and shoes. <laughs> yeah, like guns, that, that's shoes. That's a little bit... Uh, that's a, that tends to help out a little bit. The, the, yeah, it's, so the Japanese during World War II believed that... That's why they exclu- almost exclusively trained their navy to, for night fighting, because they knew that we were not good at that. Of course, that kind of doesn't work very well when you have radar and night vision... Which our guys ended up having in Korea with like uh, the M1 carbine with the like early night vision scope. Not that that was of much use when you kind of know where they are. But the Chinese would really scared our troops because they'd blow bugles and bang on drums and whistles and yell as they streamed up the hill by the thousands. I mean, you've got like ten guys protecting one hill. You know, two machine guns, mostly rifles. They're asleep in their sleeping bags. They don't expect anything. And then literally thousands of Chinese soldiers spring up right in front of them. Because they'd, silent, they'd be silent mm-hmm. until the very end. Wasn't also... I don't, I don't, I've heard this story before. I don't know if it's a myth or not, but... I don't remember if it's a myth or not, but they, they used to talk about how like the, the M1 carbine bullets couldn't uh, penetrate the like quilt... They were wearing so many layers, the like North Koreans and Chinese were wearing yeah. so many layers of like quilted clothing, the M1 carbine couldn't pierce through it. Yeah, so that's debate. I think you and I have talked about this before. Yeah, I think not, we have. Podcast, I, I don't remember what we decided about. So, veterans have said, it's agreed upon that the M1 carbine didn't have any stopping power. Yeah, that's, of course. That, that's totally true. Uh, they it's kind of debated over that because veterans were saying all right here's what i think i think that it would go through i also think that the guys that were there were shooting these chinese soldiers with 30 caliber carbine rounds and it's not powerful enough to stop them yeah. so the guys kept going and the only logical explanation in their mind is not only does it not have stopping power but because those guys were unflinching or at least oh, mostly yeah. unflinching when they got shot <laughs> Because I mean, these guys have been fighting since they were children against the Japanese, against Chiang Kai-shek, against Mao, and now they're mm-hmm. all together. This is nothing compared to what they've had to endure. Uh, that it doesn't... It, it, the only logical answer was that it, it wasn't penetrating. I think mm-hmm. they've done tests nowadays that show that, yeah, it will. It will oh, go yeah. Um, anyway, so the, the Marines beat them off that night. Heavy, heavy casualties. Uh, and by the morning... They're in headlong disaster mode. They have no idea what's going on. They haven't retreated yet, but they're about to. Not only that, the army is cut off on the north side of the ch- reservoir, the chosen mm-hmm. reservoir, and they have to fight their way to the Marines. So as they fight their way to the Marines, and the Marines hold a perimeter day in, day out, they build an airstrip to get their wounded away. And actually, it was so cold, they, they'd get shot, and the blood would instantly freeze. So the, the cold kept these guys alive. Because as soon as they started getting into... They didn't... Obviously, they didn't have, like, heated tents or anything. But as soon yeah. as they started to heat up, the, it would melt, and the blood would start pouring again. So oh, it was actually man. in their best interest to have it that cold. Because it I, I guess. <laughs> yeah, obviously, you don't want to get shot, but <laughs> it's, so, it's so cold, they'd get shot, and it'd freeze up. Oh, like, almost instantaneously. That, you know how cold that is? No, that's, absolutely. That's I don't think any of us know how cold <laughs> that's that is. That's the thing is. where you can like throw boiling water out of a pot outside and it'll immediately crystallize and freeze. It's that, but with blood, and it was it freeze over their wounds. And that is not an experiment I want to have no, to try. Oh my god, no, 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 no. Uh, so Oliver Smith orders all his men to fight their way to Hagaruri, and so they make it there, and they have more brave last stands. They're under constant attack, sniping, 
sniper fire is a huge problem during the day. At night, obviously, you have to worry about human wave attacks. And while the Marines take heavy casualties, by the end of the battle, they'll have about 750 to 900 killed. They inflict so much more. Yeah. They inflict 30 to 80,000 dead on the Chinese. Oh, man. That's just, I mean, that's insane. Yeah, that's... <laughs> oh, my God. What's the ratio of that? You have a, like, how you yeah, do, um, do let's see, it's 30,000 divided by 750 and then 80,000 divided by 750, or 750 divided by 80,000. Right. Hold on, we're, I'm a little, a little, a little slow at math here, where, so that's a hundred to one, or a, at, at the most, at or the, at least a... 40 to 1. Which is still a pretty... That's so that, insane. 40 Far, to 1 being the conservative estimate. Yeah, the Operation Barbarossa, the German invasion of Russia during World War II in its opening stages, had the average... Uh, the kill-to-loss ratio for the German army was 15 to 1. Which is still double, insane. Double and, like, that and add some for the low end, and that's what we're at. 40 to 1. That is impressive. The Marines, yeah, I mean, the Marines held on in cold weather. They're all suffering from frostbite. By the end of the battle, about a 100% of Marines involved in that will have frostbite, gunshot wounds, shrapnel wounds, or all three. Wow. That's uh... a combination of the two or all three. No one got out of that battle unscathed. So they start making convoys and they're trying to drive their way to Hungnam, a port where they can all evacuate because it's it's lost. And Oliver yeah. Smith realizes he's going to have to uh, lead a tactical retreat, which is the most difficult maneuver in military history. Eric von Manstein did it in World War II to retreat from the Russians, uh, to, at least until he lost his job because Hitler <laughs> thought he was losing too much ground. Uh <laughs> that's that's the first and only really example that comes to my mind just off the top of my head in the 20th yeah. century because it's so hard to do and it's mm-hmm. so rare. So they start to retreat, fighting retreat. And uh, I believe he says, no, we're not retreating. We're just fighting in the other direction. <laughs> I think that's his famous... Because, you know, every like great battle like that is a... Like in yeah. Battle of the Bulge, it's nuts is the yeah. great expression that comes with it. Yeah, this is... We're fighting in a different direction. We're not retreating. <laughs> That just speaks to the mentality of the Marines, uh, especially in this battle. Now, a lot of these guys actually were from Arizona, interestingly huh. enough. There's like a large number from like Arizona. Ah, uh, yes, well accustomed to the cold. <laughs> yes, the literal opposite. Oh, man. <laughs> Insane. Um, so while they're there, what would happen is these convoys of trucks would carry the wounded in the back... Uh, the Chinese would fire from the, fire onto them from the hills above because it's a really mountainous country, so they'd be driving on these roads and there'd be huge cliffs going up above and below them. And the Chinese would shoot into them and aim for the drivers. Then once the convoy was stopped and everyone had either retreated across the reservoir or gone away, they would start pouring gasoline onto the wounded in the back of the trucks and light them on fire. Classy. Awesome. So good. Yeah. What great... Jeez. That's, again, uh, so illegal um, and immoral on so many levels. And well, uh, it's just, <laughs> if, you've just, if you just ignore, like, any f- convention of war mm-hmm. in history, then it uh, oh. turns out you can do, you do a lot of new fun stuff. My God. Oh, man. Uh, task, there were a bunch of task forces assembled to try and make it to Hagaru Re to meet up with the Marines. Uh, task Force Drysdale is put together by Chesty Puller. It's 900 Marines and members of 41 Independent Royal Marine Commando. That's the the British r- commandos that had been performing for the up to that point, uh, like raids behind enemy lines. Lots of like sabotage type, yeah. type stuff. Too, really, right? I, I urge everyone to look into that. We'll probably and... end up doing an episode on them yeah. in the future. Really interesting, mm, forgotten absolutely. piece of history. And they fought really bravely with the Marines. <laughs> forgotten within the Forgotten War. Yeah, it's so sad how, how this war just completely overlooked. Um, 
And then Task Force, that's Task Force Drysdale. Task Force Faith is put together by the, like, 31st and 32nd regimental combat teams uh, on the either north or east side of the reservoir to break out. These are army guys uh, to break out and link up with the Marines. So the Marines start their headlong retreat. Again, more of these just horror stories of like burning people alive and stuff by the Chinese. And everything is going bloody and horrible and slow until they make it to uh, Funchen Pass. And so they have, to, they, they have to build a bridge across. So it was a dam and the sheer drop-offs on either side. Well, a sheer drop-off going down and then a well, sheer cliff going up for mm. the mountains. And uh, I forgot how many feet across it is, but it's blown open, and the Marines have to build a bridge. So they fly in these things called treadways. Uh, and during World War II, the U.S. improvised. They had problems with you would build an airfield, you know, just smooth over some mud mm-hmm. grass and stuff. And then if it gets bombed, you've got to fill those holes back in. You're never going to have yeah, which is you know, kind of a it's kind of a constant process that you right. can't really. And so they, we invent treadways, which are these giant pieces of steel uh, that basically interlock like puzzle pieces. Okay, and so if it gets bombed or something and attacked or shelled and it's really damaged, you can peel off the damaged section and put another one in its place. And it'll fit perfectly. So they devise that they're going to link a bunch of these together and then stretch it across. So they end up having to parachute these one piece at a time to the Marines. Who do they, after a few failed attempts, they really do bridge it across and they're, they're home free. Sort of. Yeah, sort of. <laughs> <They've> still got, <laughs> they're still ambushed constantly and attacked. And uh, by the time they evacuate the port, uh, there are 10,000 Marines wounded. It's almost the entire 1st Marine Division. Like 750 to 900 dead. I think the official estimate is like 836, but it, I think I think it's closer to 750. Uh, whereas the Chinese have lost again 30 to 80 thousand killed, and 12,500 to probably about 25 thousand wounded. Man, that's that's an, that's just an insane number. Yeah, the Ninth Army Group, six divisions out of its 12. Cease to exist. A division is such a big. Yeah, there were like, 12, 12 divisions unit. would make it up, and that's a, that's ten thousand plus plus men. Six of them are gone. Just they're literally just completely wiped out. The rest cease to exist as an effective fighting force, and out of those twelve, nine of them are completely disbanded, either because they're destroyed or the other yeah. three because they're just so they're rendered completely useless. One story that's really insane about this uh, is this guy named Private Ed Reeves. So he's wounded uh, early on in the battle, and his back gets hit by shrapnel. So he gets loaded up into one of these trucks, and they're going to try and drive to the marine perimeter at Hagaruri. Uh, so the truck is obviously stopped because the first the truck in the front of the convoy the guy the driver gets shot and then everything grinds to a halt and the chinese stream down from the hills and kill the drivers and start pouring gasoline on the dead the wounded and now dead soldiers and start to burn them so by the time they get to ed reeves truck he's still these guys are fully conscious by the way but they just can't move uh they run out of gas oh, man. so they start shooting them one by one in the head well, they come to him, and he sits up and gets shot in the face. Uh, and then hours later, he wakes up. And what happened is it had, it had gone, but it just missed everything. He was completely fine. Well, I think being I shot mean, in the face. I mean, obviously, but... being shot in the face. But he wasn't, like, blind or anything. <laughs> yeah. He had total function. It was just a, a cut. Right? Yeah, and just so, grazed him, pretty much. Yeah, deeper than a graze, not quite just, like, a direct on. <laughs> it's ridiculous that he even survives that. So this time he wakes up, but he's no longer in the truck. He's on a pile of bodies. Because they end up, they run out of gas, so they just shoot him and then pile him up on the side of the road. And so they're just piled, like, he's inside of a mountain of bodies. And they start rummaging through, 
and taking valuables off these guys, and they come to him and they realize that he's still breathing. So they smack him in the face with the butt of the rifle and just start to beat the crap out of him. And he's horribly bloodied. Uh, I think he like loses hearing in one ear. And on top of that, his fingers now have like frostbite. His hands are all frostbitten. Uh, and the, the Chinese go back up into the hills and he starts to crawl away. Remember, he can't use yeah, cause he's he can't use his shotgun. legs. He's got he's almost shrapnel damage in the spine. But he crawls across the entire reservoir and ends up getting like dragged by a couple guys, and they all get rescued by Marines that have to go out uh, and collect guys that are wandering across the reservoir that are wounded. Oh, jeez, what a story! But he, I mean, he survives it all, and he ended up getting married in like 1952 and went on to have a fine life. It's amazing. <laughs> it's insane. It was a ridiculous tale. He yeah. wasn't even like paralyzed or anything. No, he, he could never walk again. Oh, <laughs> so not like That's totally unfortunate, a great but... life. But I mean, he survived getting shot in the face. He crawled across the chosen reservoir. He got the snot beat out of him by Chinese soldiers, and the whole time he kept going. And that's overall that's a pretty amazing. great, yeah, like metaphor for the how the Marines acted at Chosin. Uh, by 1951. The Marines are out of Hunnam, and UN forces are in a headlong retreat. Uh, Commonwealth soldiers actually have a fantastic last stand at a pass where they hold off the advancing Chinese armies and save Seoul. Uh, and by 19, like June of 1951, everything's at a standstill. It turns into a stalemate. And it pretty much remains that way until the... War is like kind of quote unquote over it, in fifty three. Yeah, and it it turns into just a, a stalemate. It's a war of trenches, like World War One trenches, except instead of in the no man's land of Europe, they're in the high mountains of Korea. It's sadly it is the forgotten war. Yeah, uh, and we had three hundred thousand guys fight there. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's. Yeah, it's really it's really sad that it's forgotten, but it is. And the line, the border is pretty close to the thirty eighth parallel. The, mm-hmm. And what China did is they proved themselves to be on equal footing, kind of with the West. Yeah. It's not like because every time before that, East meets West, the West would destroy them. And now China has proven herself mm-hmm. to be not only a world player but a world power. Yeah. So. <laughs> The effects of that are still affecting us to this yeah, day, yeah. given as North Korea is a country and we have people like Kim Il-sung's son and grandson, Kim Jong-un, <laughs> running the country. Not his son is dead, but Kim Jong-un, his grandson, runs the country. Uh, all, all, all classy guys, a real, yeah. real oh, cool family. You know, we forgot, we forgot to talk about how crazy MacArthur got. And MacArthur oh, yeah. ended up. He wanted. He wanted to nuke China. Yeah, his idea was to like nuke. His his idea Beijing. was to like carpet bomb Beijing. Which, carpet bang. Carpet bomb with, with nukes. Yeah. Beijing, which, which is most. <laughs> I, you don't necessarily have to be a military strategist to know that that has, might have some repercussions. Just and also bit. be an enormous human rights violation. Yeah, and then and turn, like kind turn of Manchuria, genocide. Turn Manchuria and the Chinese production zone into a nuclear wasteland completely impassable. Yeah, his idea was just to wipe the population centers of China <laughs> off the map. Yeah, they don't exist anymore. Everyone's incinerated. He loses his job because of that one. Yeah, which is... Kind of, kind of a strange uh, tactical decision, like, right after doing the awesome invasion of Inchon. It is really, I mean, it is. Like, it's a, it's a genius really genius thing. strategy, and it worked worked without a hitch. Yeah. And, like, it it had China not gotten involved would have, you know, changed the tide of the war. It did, try, it did change the tide yeah. of world history, and it would have changed it even more. Had, we would have gotten away with it, too, for you know, free meddling Chinese. <laughs> for you meddling <clears throat> volunteers. Yeah. Goodness. All right. Well, thank you guys so much for listening. Uh, next episode, we'll be starting our World War II series. 
this is going to be focusing on U.S. battles during World mm-hmm. War II. And then after that, uh, <laughs> probably, I don't know. We'll do, we'll, we'll, f- we'll figure We'll go out. from there. I don't want to, I don't make any promises. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, with our, with our podcast regularity, we, we're not in a position with our, upload schedule we're not in a position to make too many promises right anyway thank you guys so much for listening and uh we will upload next time again it'll be on guadalcanal or midway maybe both (laughs) who knows